Good morning, everybody. Nice to be here in Toronto. I brought, I guess, all the rain from Washington to you folks. Thanks for coming. I want to start on a somber note. I hope it'll end up being a liberating reflection. We've had two events in the last three years, which I believe signal the beginning of the long, torturous endgame for an industrial revolution based on fossil fuels. First event, July 2008. You remember that month. The price of oil hit $147 a barrel on world markets. And all the other prices across the supply chain went through the roof for all our goods and services because everything is embedded in, made by, moved by fossil fuels. We grow our food in petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides. Virtually all of our construction materials are petrochemical fossil fuel based. Almost all of our pharmaceutical products are still fossil fuel based. Our synthetic fiber, our power, our heat, our light. We've built a great civilization based on the carbon deposits of the Carboniferous Age. And actually, just as an aside, I often wonder if we do survive this century, and I say that not glibly, what future generations of 100,000 years from now will think of us. None of this will be here. None of the human artifacts. And the only record they'll have that we were ever here is our carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide footprint in the geological record. And they're likely to say, way back then, 100,000 years ago, they were the fossil fuel people. We had the Bronze Age, we had the Iron Age. They lived off carbon deposits, built a short-lived, great, but dangerous civilization. So when oil hit $147 a barrel, all the other prices from groceries to petrol, clothes, all went through the roof, and the entire economic engine shut down, purchasing power quit. What I'm suggesting to you, the business community here, that was the economic earthquake. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock. They're related. I won't go into the relationship in detail. You can, in chapter one of the new book, The Third Industrial Revolution, goes into why this happened. But we have hit peak globalization. We now, at least in the business community, know the outer limits of how far we can globalize this world based on fossil fuels. It's about 150 a barrel. We hit the wall every time. The reason we've hit peak globalization and an end game is because we've hit both peak oil per capita and now we've hit peak oil production. Peak oil per capita occurred in 1979, and there's no controversy about this. BP did the study, been confirmed by many studies since. Had we distributed all the crude oil that we had in 1979, the height of the auto age, to everyone living on the planet at that point, of time, that's the most each person could have, if we shared it. We found more oil in the last 30 years, but population rose quicker. So if we shared all the crude oil we have now with 6.8 billion people, there's simply less to go around. And then in 2006, we hit global peak oil production. Now, this has been a controversial question until last December. Between the optimists and pessimists, when do we hit global peak oil production? That's when half the oil is used up, the crude oil. And when that happens, it's over. You cannot afford the price. Last December, the International Energy Agency, which we rely on across the world for our energy stats, they said that it looks like we peaked in global oil production in 2006 at 70 million barrels of crude oil a day. We're going to plateau down to 69 million barrels in the next 20 years. And listen to this in the business community at a cost of $7 trillion to get the remaining crude oil out. So, when China and India made a move to bring a third of the human race into the game at an 8, 10, 12, 14% growth rate in the late 90s and the first decade of this 20th, first century, the demand pressure on crude oil was so great, price went up for oil, all the other prices go up, Purchasing power shut down at 147 a barrel. This is an end game. Here's what I'm suggesting to you. 
Every time we try to regrow this global economy, start the engine again, at the same rate we were growing before July 2008, oil prices shoot up, all the other prices for goods and services shoot up, purchasing power goes down, the engine shuts down. This is exactly what's happening this morning. When the global economy collapsed in 2008, there was no economic activity for a year, so oil went down to 30 a barrel. As soon as we started replenishing the inventory in 2010, oil shot up to 94 a barrel. It's 106 for Brent crude this morning. Purchasing power is going down because prices are going up, and we're into a second collapse. This is what my colleagues have not yet understood. So what we have here is a dangerous end game of regrowth collapse, regrowth collapse in four year intervals or less. If there's a way to get through this wall that I've just explained, I would love someone to tell me how we do it. We're in peak globalization. We're in a 30 year end game. How do we keep this system from collapsing on life support while we figure out an alternative quickly? The second major event, Copenhagen, December 2009. Our world leaders come together from 192 countries to address the entropy bill for the industrial age. Do I have some engineers and physicists here today? You know you cannot escape the second law of thermodynamics. This is not a metaphor. We have spewed massive amounts of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide into the atmosphere during the first and second industrial revolutions of the 19th and 20th century. Simply speaking, we have so much carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide in the atmosphere that when the sun hits the earth, the heat tries to radiate back, it hits those molecules, and it forces it back down. How bad is it? In 2007, the UN Panel on Climate Change issued its long-awaited assessment report, fourth assessment report, 2,500 scientists, 120 countries, all the major academies of science, the longest scientific project in history. They issued the report in Paris. I was there. President Chirac asked me to come in. We had world leaders there to address what do we do next. And the first thing I had to say when I got there is I had to say I had it wrong for 30 years. This is not a pleasant thing to say. I got it wrong for 30 years. Some of you older folks remember a book I did called Entropy in 1980. It was one of the first books on climate change. While I spent all of these years on climate change, I continued to underestimate the speed and acceleration of climate change because I couldn't intellectually wrap my mind around all the feedback loops. We can't model the feedback loops. They're too complicated. They're unknowns. And then when they happen, we say, oh my god, how do we miss it? It is the feedback loops in this terribly complicated biosphere that are terrifying us. This is really an uncontrolled experiment with an entire planet. How bad is it? The, set, the report said three degrees Celsius rise in this century. Now that's looking conservative. But to give you an idea of what three degree rise means, it takes us back to the temperature on Earth three million years ago in the Pliocene. Completely different world. And what is substantially different, it's all about the water cycles. It's all about the hydrological cycles. For every one degree Celsius that the temperature rises on this little planet, the atmosphere absorbs 7% more precipitation from the ground, just sucks it up. So that means the entire hydrological cycle of the Earth unbends in a moment of time. More floods, more droughts, more wildfires. The trees can't catch up. The ecosystems can't catch up. And so now our scientists say that we are on the beginnings of a mass extinction event right now. Right now. And by the end of the century, parents, your children and grandchildren will may be in a world where we see the loss of 25% species loss on the low side. And listen to this, a 70% wipeout of all the species of life on this planet by the end of the century. We need to be clear what this means. We've had five biological extinction events in the last 450 million years on Earth. Every time there was a mass extinction, it took 10 million years to recover the biodiversity we lost. As my wife says, 
We're just not grasping the enormity of this moment. We are sleepwalking as a species. So what do we do? Peak globalization, 147 a barrel. Every time we try to restart the engine, it's going to shut down within three to four year intervals. Real-time climate change now affecting agricultural yields all over the world and infrastructure loss. So what do we do? We need a new economic vision, a new economic game plan that's compelling, that's practical, that can be delivered in less than 40 years, that can move as quickly or more quickly in the developing world as the developed world and gets us off carbon. Two generations, 40 years. So the question we need to ask is step back and ask, what, how do the great economic revolutions in history occur? Because if we know how they occur, we have a roadmap for where we want to go. The great economic revolutions in history occur when two things happen. First, we change the way we organize energy. And we've had many different energy regimes through our 175,000 years here. We are the youngest species on the planet, the babies. When we change energy regimes, they make possible more complex civilizations. They allow us, with the new energy flows, to annihilate time and space, bring more people together in commerce and trade and social life, differentiate skills and integrate into larger social units. Societies are just a, an extension of our social units. But these new energy regimes are so complex, they require another revolution, a communication revolution to manage them. It's when energy revolutions converge and merge with communication revolutions that we change history. The communications become the media to manage the complexities of new energy regimes and civilizations. And you know what? It not only changes the economics, it changes consciousness. I'll give you a brief history. Forager hunter societies. The energy was the human body, foraging and hunting. Every one of them created language to forage, hunt, and groom. And every forager hunter society in history had mythological consciousness, without exception. That's how the brain was wired given their energy communication regime. And the basic human drive, the basic human drive, which by the way is not predatory, competitive, utilitarian, and pleasure-seeking, those are secondary drives. The basic human drive, as we're learning from our scientists in the last 20 years, built into our neural circuitry, is empathic distress. Several primate species have it, elephants, we do, built into our neural circuitry, in our mirror neurons, empathic distress, which allows us to solidify in units that extended only to blood ties tribal. If you were another tribe in the next valley, you were a demon. The great hydraulic civilizations beginning in Sumeria, Mesopotamia, ancient Iraq, they created very advanced centralized irrigation agricultural systems and the stored grain was the energy. We captured photosynthesis in barley, wheat, and rye stored energy. They had to build canals and royal roads and granaries and distribution systems. It was so damn complicated, they created cuneiform to manage it, writing. And everywhere we see these great hydraulic civilizations, the Middle East, the Indus Valley of India, China, and the Yangtze, Mexico, and this is amazing. Independently, people figure out some form of writing to manage this new energy regime. And we moved to theological consciousness, from mythological consciousness. All the great religions were formed back then. Judaism, I'm Jewish, people of the book, the Bible. Buddhism, script. And empathic distress, it evolved to a new fictional family, religious ties, not blood-related. So all Jews empathize with Jews as brothers and sisters. First generation in Rome, Christians in the first century start kissing each other on the cheek and say brother and sister, which was a weird concept. In the 19th century, another convergence of communication energy, first industrial revolution, print technology becomes very cheap with linotype and rotary steam power. We can mass produce cheaply in print. We introduce public schools in Europe and America. We create a print literate workforce with the cognitive communication skills to organize the complexities of coal and rail. Without a literate workforce, we couldn't have done it. And we move to ideological consciousness, the Enlightenment, the counter-Enlightenment, and empathic distress evolved to a new fictional family, national identity. All of a sudden, there's something called France. That's a fiction. 
There were 200 languages in that space in the 1400s. Now there's something called France, and all French people kiss each other on the cheek and say brother and sister, but they don't want to have anything to do with the Germans. All right? So in the 20th century, another convergence of communication energy, the second industrial revolution, centralized electricity, the telephone, later radio and television become the communication media to organize a more dispersed auto, oil, and suburban culture and a mass consumer culture. And we shift to psychological consciousness. You and I think therapeutically. Grandma couldn't think psychologically if her life depended on it. She could think ideologically and theologically and mythologically, but she couldn't think therapeutically. And empathy now extends to people with like-minded associational ties, soulmates. <laughs> There have been dark periods in history. This isn't linear. There have been blowdowns. There have been backlashes. But there's some hope here because what we do see is a body evolutionary trend from mythological consciousness to theological to ideological to psychological. And the basic empathic drive is extended from blood ties to religious association to national loyalties. So here's my question this morning. Why would we stop here? Is it possible to imagine the next stage, which is biosphere consciousness? To see ourselves as one extended human family, living together with our fellow creatures on this planet, and our boundary is the biosphere in which all the geochemical and living processes interact to allow us to survive. We are on the cusp of a new emergence of communication energy. It's unfolding in Europe in the last 24 months. It could get us to biosphere consciousness in time, maybe. We've had a very powerful communication revolution in the last 15 years, the internet. Now this is very different than 20th century electricity communication, which was centralized, top down. The internet is distinguished as a communication tool because it's distributed, collaborative, and it scales laterally, which, by the way, are the key terms for the new business models and the new political models of the 21st century. It's distributed, it's collaborative, it scales laterally. Today, and we did this in 20 years, today two and a half billion people have a little utensil, a handheld computer or an iPhone or a cell phone, and they can send their own video, audio, and text to each other, all two billion, at the speed of light, with more power than all the centralized television networks, and we did this in 25 years. The internet communication revolution is just now merging with a new energy regime. Distributed communication to organize distributed energy, and when that happens, we have a very powerful nervous system for a new infrastructure, for a new economic paradigm that might get us to biosphere consciousness in time. What are distributed energies? Well, let me compare them to the energies we're familiar with, elite energies, coal, oil, natural gas, uranium. Look, they're only elite because when you go home today, there's a pretty good chance you don't have them in your backyard. They're only found in a few places. They require huge military investments to secure them, coal, oil, gas, uranium huge geopolitical investments to manage them, and massive infusions of finance capital to organize them and be clear that the fossil fuel energy regime and nuclear power is the most centralized, top-down, elite energy regime and the most costly in history. But now those energies are sunsetting. Does anyone think the price of coal, oil, gas, shale gas, tar sands is going to go down, down, down? And the technologies based on those energies, like the internal combustion engine, have exhausted their S-curve. And the whole infrastructure built from carbon is on life support. How do you regrow the economy with a paradigm that's on life support? And now we have climate change at the back door, moving to the front door. What are distributed energies? They're energies that are found in every square inch of the world. The sun shines all over this planet every day. The wind blows across the earth 24 hours a day. Wherever we walk, there's a hot geothermal core of heat under this planet, ready to be taken for energy. In the rural areas, we have forestry and agricultural waste. On the coastal areas, where our urban populations are, the ocean tides and waves are coming in every day. Wherever there's small hydro, there's electricity. If you have garbage, it can be anaerobically decongested back into energy. 
And my friends, <laughs> we have enough renewable energy to supply this species until kingdom comes. The European Union has committed itself to a five-pillar infrastructure to create a third industrial revolution. I was privileged to develop this infrastructure plan. It was endorsed by the European Parliament in June 2007. It's working its way through the European Commission. Germany is leading it. I was with Chancellor Merkel last week. If you look up on YouTube, you can see the event. She had me, asked me to come in after Fukushima. Germany is leading in all five pillars, the economic engine of Europe. No small thing, because Germany vies with China as the leading exporting nation in the world. Here are the pillars. Pillar one. The EU is committed to 20% renewable energy by 2020. That's a mandate, not a suggestion. Every country has to do it. 27 nations, 500 million people. That's a third of the electricity green. Pillar two, how do we collect these energies? Now, our first thought in Brussels was that's easy. The sun, let's go to the Mediterranean. They got sun all the time. Let's grab it, put in the big solar parks, put a high voltage line in, ship it out. The Irish have the wind, the Norwegians have the hydro, ship it out. Let me say that none of us, I do not oppose larger concentrated solar, wind, geothermal, and some hydro and biomass stuff. I don't oppose it. They're essential, but not sufficient. They're transitional, but they are a smaller and smaller part of a third industrial revolution rollout. While distributed energies are distributed, they can go from concentrated to dispersed. In other words, the sun is distributed, it's everywhere, but you can concentrate it or disperse. So we began to ask a question in Brussels, which now this morning seems embarrassingly obvious. We started to realize we were thinking 20th century based on centralized energies. So we began to ask the question, if renewable energies are distributed, and they're literally found in some proportion of frequency in every square inch of the world, why in heaven's name would we only be collecting them in a few central points. That got us to pillar two, buildings. We have 191 million buildings in the European Union, homes, offices, factories, technology and industrial parks. The goal is to convert every single building on the European continent to a micro power plant in the next 40 years. To grab the sun off the roof, the wind off the sidewalls, the geothermal heat under the ground, the garbage, the works. The new buildings, positive power. Buig Construction, the largest construction company in the world, has just put up the gorgeous office complex in Paris near the OECD headquarters. It's positive power. It's so sophisticated it grabs enough sun so it powers all of its own needs and it can send back to the grid. It's pillar two jump starts construction. We are talking about thousands and thousands of businesses, SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, and millions and millions of workers to convert the entire infrastructure of Europe. 40 years. And construction's the elephant in the room. Pillar three is the tough one. Renewable energy is one, two, our micro power plants, our buildings collect the energy, we jumpstart the economy. Pillar three, storage. The sun isn't always shining in Toronto. The wind isn't always blowing in Ontario. Water tables can be down for hydroelectricity if you have climate change induced droughts, so what do we do? We have to store them. In California, we put in big wind parks. We're losing three out of four kilowatts because the wind's blowing at the wrong time. In fact, across the renewable energies, wind, solar, we're losing three out of four kilowatts because we have no way to store them because the sun and wind aren't always out there. Pillar three, storage. We like flywheels and batteries and capacitors and water pumping, all of it. But we also are putting most of our commitment at the center of this storage possibilities into hydrogen. We want them all. Hydrogen is the basic element of the universe. It's the stuff of the stars. It carries other energies. It's modular so you can scale it up from small homes to huge infrastructures. The EU has committed 8 billion euros last year to public-private partnerships to put hydrogen across the infrastructure. My friend Daryl Wilson here at Hydrogenics, which is the oldest electrolyzer company in the world, he was a student of mine at our advanced management program. Is he here today? No. Should have invited him, actually. 
They're doing infrastructure across Germany now for hydrogen. Canadian company. So pillar three, storage. Here's how it works. If the sun hits your roof let's, at your university, you have solar on your roof, on your big buildings, you generate electricity. If you don't need some of it, you put that electricity in water. Hydrogen comes out of, into a tank. When the sun's not hitting the roof, the gymnasium or whatever, you just convert it back to electricity. A small, tiny thermodynamic loss compared to getting coal, oil, gas, and uranium to you from the well to the end user. Pillar four, this is the interesting pillar. This is where the internet communication revolution converges with the new distributed energies to create a distributed nervous system for a new economy. We use off the shelf, off the shelf internet technology. We're going to take the transmission lines of Europe and convert the entire electricity grid to an energy internet. It's going to cost us money. It's going to be done in the next 20 years. So that when millions and millions and millions of buildings are collecting just a little bit of their own green energy, storing it in hydrogen, like we store media in digital, if you don't need some of it at any given time of the day, you can program your software to send it back across Europe on an energy internet, just like you create your own information, store it in digital, and share it online. Germany is testing in six regions the entire grid right now in Germany. Pillar five. Plug-in transport, electric vehicles came out this year. I came here to this meeting in a Nissan Leaf this morning. Beautiful, noiseless, loved it. Fuel cell hydrogen vehicles will be out. Mass production, done deal. 2014, Daimler, GM, Toyota, they're on a race. So you plug in your cars, buses, and trucks anywhere in your infrastructure, which is collecting green energy. And then anywhere you're traveling, you can stop at a power charging unit and either buy from the grid or sell back. These five pillars together are the new technology revolution. Separately, and I want to really stress this for the government people, business people, and, and NGOs here. Separately, they're just components. Together, they create a distributed nervous system for a new infrastructure for the 21st century. Renewable energies collected by buildings, stored in the form of hydrogen, shared across energy internets, plugged into logistics so that we can have commerce and trade. If one pillar falls behind the other pillar, or if they stand alone, you lose billions and billions of dollars. This is where President Obama got it wrong. His heart was in the right place. He wanted a green economy. He spent tens of billions of dollars on isolated projects. So he visits a battery factory here and a photovoltaic factory over there. And they uh, seemingly have no relation to each other. And because they're isolated and, po and not connected, he's lost it. We realized this in Europe last year. And the EU leaked a document saying, oh my God, we need one trillion euros now for the grid in the next 10 years. Why? We put in feed-in tariffs like you did in Ontario, and you are leading North America. Ontario is leading on all of this in all of the Americas. We put in a feed-in tariff, see if this sounds familiar, and then we realized everybody's trying to get energy into the grid now, thousands of players, but the grid is old top-down, servo-mechanical, unidirectional, can't take the new energy because of the feed-in tariffs, can't get in. Then we realize, oh my gosh, some of our regions have been so successful on the feed-in tariffs in Europe that they're 20, 30, 40 percent renewable energy. We're losing three out of four kilowatts because we don't have the hydrogen storage in. Then we realize we didn't properly incentivize Pillar 2, the buildings, the big companies got the contracts for the big wind parks and solar parks, which we are in favor of. But the homeowners and the small and medium-sized enterprises, their electricity price went up slightly, a tiny bit. They're not getting any of the action, so they're a little bit upset. So we now realize we have to incentivize green loans for homeowners and SMEs, and we're doing that in the last 24 months. And if you're not doing it in Ontario, line your banks up. Are there any bankers here? Bankers. Let me tell you how we're doing it. And it's amazing that they're not doing it. In Italy, which is very bureaucratic, right? Companies have been set up, and they put all the national banks together, these startup companies, in a consortium. You sign a paper saying you want 30,000 euro power plant on your roof. 60 days later, it's on your roof in Italy. Why? The banks automatically will come in with a, small, with a low discount green loan because they check your electricity meter. And they know you can pay as you save. It's a done deal and you pay back, and then you have energy savings, then you're a producer.
and you appreciate the real estate value of your commercial or residential holding, and the banks are doing it in Germany. Where are we in North America? This is not rocket science. Then we realized the electric cars are out, fuel cell cars are coming out. If we can't plug them into the other four pillars, we're going to lose it. So the synergies of these five pillars create the revolution. For 30 years, governments have said to me, Mr. Rifkin, come on. <laughs> how are you, you going to run the world on solar roofs and garbage and windmills? And, I mean, this is nice. We know the young people like it. It's safe. It's benign. And certainly, it's good, but it's soft energy. You can't run a powerful global economy on soft energy. You need coal, oil, gas, uranium, tar sands. We couldn't answer this question, frankly, for 30 years. We had the answer for the last 15. It's called Grid IT 2.0, the cutting edge of the IT sector. In the 90s, in Silicon Valley, researchers figured out a way to connect up thousands or millions of desktop computers with software. When we connect them, the distributed computing power dwarfs centralized supercomputers. We can now take Grid IT to the power lines when millions and millions of players are producing their own green electricity, storing it in hydrogen. By grid IT, we can now set up the transmission line so it can be shared and the distributed energy that we create dwarfs these teeny little old-fashioned nuclear coal-fired power plants, but this energy goes with the rhythms of the earth. This has to go with the flows of the biosphere. This is post-carbon. The music companies simply did not understand file sharing and music. All the kids apparently had nothing else to do after school but find out new ways to get this music for free. You can't beat millions and millions of little kids and that's all they have to do after school. And so the music companies tumbled in five years. And the newspapers didn't get the distributed computing power of the blogosphere. Now the newspapers are going out of business. They're setting up blogs. And certainly Encyclopedia Britannica could not imagine why millions of people would come together freely and recreate the knowledge of the world and cross-check each other's accuracy, it's called Wikipedia. If we think that's impressive, what happens when the internet connects up to energy? It's a thousand times more important because it's the democratization of energy, it's power to the people, it's distributed capitalism, it extends our market forces in ways we've never seen, but it requires collaboration as well. It requires a social market model. It requires everyone being an entrepreneur, but everyone collaborating in deep commons. It's going to change the political landscape, fundamentally. We are shifting from traditional power, energy regime we've had scaled vertically, because fossil fuels are elite and centralized and require a lot of capital. So we scaled them vertically, and then all the businesses we created were vertical, big centralized factories, and big centralized logistics. The third industrial revolution scales laterally. It's lateral power. It's when millions and millions of players connect and then create net vast networks to share that we see the potential multiplier effect. The first and second industrial revolution favored national markets and nation states. That was the temporal spatial boundaries. The third industrial revolution favors continental markets and it favors continental political unions. Why? It's going to come in like Wi-Fi. I have a global team of 120 companies, Cisco, IBM, Philips, Kima, Arup, lots of companies, and we've done some master plans in the last year for San Antonio, Rome, uh, Monaco, Utrecht, other places. And what we realized is this third industrial revolution comes in city to city region to region. As each region comes together with public-private partnerships, civil society at the table with business and government, they create the five pillars. But then they are a node, and what the node wants to do is connect with the next node, and the next node, and the next node to share it. It's coming in like Wi-Fi, node to node to node, until we create a vast bottom-bottom network. The federal government's role, set up the standards, set up the playing field, set up the regulations, set up the incentives. The regions here, the province's role, are to make this happen at that level, and then the local role is to put in the nodes. This third industrial revolution favors the developing countries. Forty percent of the human race make two dollars a day or less. 
25% of the human race this morning has never, ever, ever had any electricity at all. Quarter of the human race. That's the best we could do with fossil fuels. Another 20% of the human race has only marginal access to electricity. What we're finding now is we're using the cell phone metaphor. We could not figure out how the cell phones could come in so quickly in Africa with no electricity grid. They leaped ahead. What we're realizing in the developing world is because there's no infrastructure, they can actually leap ahead and put some solar on, put some wind on, put some microgrids on, and then connect with a brand new infrastructure from scratch and move it. It's like a house. If you have a whole old house, my wife and I have been renovating this old house for 20 years. It is a bottomless pit. If you build a new house from scratch, it's cheaper and quicker. It's the same thing with the grid. Let me just explain in the last few minutes a little bit about this new business model. I'm sure we have, do we have people here from the power and utility companies without embarrassing you? Because you're going to be very important to us. Anybody? At first, the European power and utility companies, they weren't happy with this. They said, hey, wait, we don't like this. Lateral power? We like to have control over the supply, control over the transmission lines, and we want to sell a hell of a lot of electrons. Then we created a new business model. The new business model is breaking the utilities across Europe because it's a better model. We first did it with EMBW in Germany, NTR in Ireland, Scottish Power, and now others are joining. The new model is clear. Millions of us are going to produce our own green energy because it's almost, it is free. The technology is going to go on the same curve as computers and cell phones. It took 25 years to get to their all point where they're almost free. We're seeing the same curve in solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, hydro. The prices are getting cheaper and cheaper as we scale laterally. Eventually, they'll be almost so cheap you get them for free, like you now get a cell phone and you pay for the service, not the cell phone. Once you have that technology going down, 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 the sun is free. You just have to then get it. The wind's free. The heat under your ground is free. The garbage is free. So millions of us will be producing our own energy. And I should say this starts in day one. As soon as Ontario lays down a master plan for these five pillars and you begin integrating your new investment in it, you start with huge amounts of jobs day one. Huge amounts of jobs in infrastructure and businesses day one. And let me say for those who think you can't afford it, come on. You spend money on infrastructure every year anyway. Good times, bad times, GDP, you spend money on new investments. The question is, do you invest in an old infrastructure that's on life support, or do you invest in the sunrise energies and industries of a new infrastructure that will create a multiplier effect? You want to keep the old infrastructure alive, but you want to invest in the new. So, the utility companies, we say to them, we, producer and consumer co-ops, businesses, industrial parks, will increasingly provide our energy with the feed-in tariffs. You, the utility company, you're going to run the grid because it's complicated. You'll run the energy internet. And the way you'll make money, and tell this to all your power and utility friends, the way you'll make money is you will set up relationships with thousands of corporate clients. And you will make money by selling them less electrons. How do you do it? We use the IBM cliche case study that every MBA student has to suffer through. You recall IBM was in trouble in the 90s. Nobody was buying, their computer had no margin. Everybody was selling the same computer. There was no margins. The Chinese and Indians could make it even cheaper. So IBM had a soul searching discussion. How do we make money in the 21st century? Selling computers doesn't do it. So they decided that their real expertise is not making a physical computer. Their real expertise is managing information. Now every company in the world has a chief information officer in their entire industry that manages information flows. What is the primary expertise of a utility company? It's not selling electrons. It's managing energy flows. So they will set up commercial partnerships with corporate clients to manage their energy flows across the supply chain and the value chain to keep their energy costs low, their thermodynamic efficiency high, and their productivity will go up. And for the business people, let me say this, whether you survive or fail in the next 25 years on your watch depends purely on your energy margins, not your labor cost anymore. In this volatile period of transition, 
between the old and new infrastructure and energy regimes, whether you succeed or fail, will depend on your energy margins, and that will depend on the energy you embed in your products, your supply chain, your logistics, everything. To the extent the utility companies can help you manage your energy flows to keep your thermodynamic efficiency up, your productivity moving, your energy costs down, then the clients will share their savings and productivity in contracts back to the utility companies. And if they can't do it, there's going to be lots of startup companies that are going to do it for them. This is called performance contracting, shared savings. We're already doing this. It's already begun. So let me end with the question of can we shift consciousness? The third industrial revolution allows us to think biosphere consciousness. During the first and second industrial revolutions, when we went to coal, oil, gas, and uranium, these hard objects, we lost our connection to the rhythms of nature. We no longer had to be tied to the seasonal flows in terms of our survival. So we divorced ourselves from nature and thought we could do it on our own. It was a deception, the stored sun. As we move to the third industrial revolution, we move back to the rhythms of the planet. And when we see already what's going on in Germany, people have to monitor the rhythms each day, the solar flow, the radiance, it's right there on their dials, the wind flows, how the geothermal heat is conditioning in different seasons, what's happening with the garbage on anaerobic decomposition. So it actually creates a situation where we re-embed ourselves with the rhythms of the earth and we each take responsibility for the biosphere where we are. But then we connect nodally across continents and we become aware we're part of a pretty small planet. Unless you think this is academic, go into any school in Ontario. Nine-year-old kids are coming home from school and they're saying to mommy and daddy, why did we keep the electricity on in that room last night? We didn't need it. Why is the TV still on, on control mode instead of off? How come we have such a big car in the driveway? Where did the hamburger come from on my plate? Second major cause of climate change, beef production consumption. Number three is transport. Or mommy and daddy, where did my clothes come from? Because the kids are learning all over the world, and this has happened in less than seven or eight years, that everything we do and everything they do has an ecological footprint that affects some other family, some other creature, in some other part of the planet. The kids are learning systemic thinking, systems thinking, that everything connects to everything else. We are actually having a revolution in education, we don't know it, which is probably good, because if we knew it, we probably wouldn't do it. And that is the kids are learning to connect the dots on how everything relates to everything else on this planet. This is biosphere consciousness. And our communication technology and energy will bring us so closely together over time and space that we can breathe as if we were in each other's backyards. That's what happened when Japan struck on the Fukushima. Everyone felt that nuclear disaster was in our backyard. We could smell it, we could feel it, we could see our brothers and sisters suffering. So I'm gonna end with this thought. How many of you have taken your National Geographic DNA test? Oh, look at this, very advanced room. Usually it's only one. Pretty, it was interesting, wasn't it? It's fun. You send $100 to the National Geographic website, they send you back a bio kit. My wife and I and my in-laws took DNA out of our cheek and put it in the kit. Sent it back to the National Geographic, they analyzed our DNA, they sent back the results, and they tell us, based on our genetics, where we migrated from all the way back to the beginning of history, our particular family. It's wild, but if I may, I'm going to save everyone the $100 here. There's something else they tell us that apparently I didn't know. 175,000 years ago, Rift Valley of Africa, there were about 10,000 anatomically modern human beings, our ancestors, walking those grasslands. Our geneticist located one woman, she's a fictitious woman, it's a database line for genetic evolution, they call her the, the, the mitochondrial DNA Eve. Apparently, her genes, her genes alone, passed to everybody in this room. The other ladies didn't make it. It gets even more strange. 40,000 years ago, they located a male, fictional data line. They call him the Y chromosome Adam, apparently fairly potent gentleman. His genes passed to every man, woman in this room. The other guys didn't make it. Here's the news. We all came from two people.
The Bible actually got this one right. right? We could have come from bigger lineages, but the point I'm making is, here we are on this planet fighting about the little things. We're divided across consciousness lines, mythological, theological, ideological, psychological, biosphere consciousness, whether we only affiliate with blood ties or, national, or religious ties or national loyalties. And when we see the Earth from outer space, it's so tiny, it's so beautiful, it's so interesting, and there's something here we have not spotted anywhere in the universe, it's called life. We don't know what it is, it's an existential journey, we're not sure why we're even here, but we know th one, one thing for sure. We all wake up every morning, and most of us say, another day. I want to I want to experience this as much as I can. Our mission now, keep this world alive. Keep this planet alive. This is not just a business plan or a technology plan. The, t the plan is common sense. We know we have to get off carbon, right? That means renewables. We know we have to collect them. That's our infrastructure to collect them, the buildings. We know we have to store them because they're intermittent, so we have to have hydrogen and other storage technologies. We know we have to share them across continents to run a global society. That's an energy internet. And we know we have to plug them into transport so we can have commerce, trade, and social life. This is a plan that's practical. But if we don't have biosphere consciousness, if we don't think as a species, if we don't steward our fellow creatures, they have a right to be here with us or without us, we're not going to make it. So here's my hope. I am in the single region in all of the Americas that's the most advanced on what I've talked about, Ontario. And I travel, I was in Argentina last week, I mentioned your feed-in tariff. You are the most advanced right now in the Americas. But you are still nowhere near where we need to go, which is these five pillars, but you can be the flagship. Here, bring your business community together with your government and your civil society. And bring in the financial community and roll out these five pillars, create master plans, bring everyone to the table, set up a node, and start connecting to the other regions. And the legacy will you, you will leave here is not just a business legacy. You'll leave a legacy for future generations that on your watch, the parents in this room, you did something about it. You took the opportunities right here in Ontario and you flagshipped it for Canada and for the world. I was just in Calgary recently with the folks out there in the industry. I know that there's a real debate now on this pipeline going from there to Houston, and I'm saying we can do better. There's enough wind out there in Alberta and to, for all the needs that we'll ever have. But now the Canadians have to step to the fore. We don't want the world to think that we are so desperate that the only way we can survive is to go to tar sands and supply the United States of America so we can move heavily into so the mission in Canada, we need two generations. Be mindful, focus, put in the five pillar infrastructure, be an example to Canada, and let example for Canada spread across the Americas, join the European Union, and let's create a sustainable post-carbon society by the mid part of this century. That's a worthy legacy for everyone in this room. We don't have a plan B. We really don't have a choice.